this book is like a non horror backrooms meets total recall. That's like literally exactly the way it is. I know exactly what both of those two things are. Total recalls <laughs> a, a movie of No, no, don't tell her. If she doesn't know, she has to live with her ignorance and shame. I have zero shame. It's like she's never watched The Godfather. I've watched The Godfather, <laughs> you son of a bitch. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast, Unresolved Textual Tension. It's me, Maria, your host, with my handsome bitches, Katie and William. And what book are we doing today? Piranesi. By Susanna Clark. And uh, this is one of our book club um, picks. It was chosen by our patrons. It was nominated a couple times. Here's the thing. I didn't really want to read it because I don't really like reading literary type books. And I thought this was going to be a literary and type yet, book. And he loves if any sci-fi or fantasy book feels like a literary type book. Yeah. But I don't like like literary, literary books because a lot of times it's just like, men are being annoyed that they're like going through existential crises anyway i love this book i love it to bits it is one of my favorite books that we've read and it is uh gorgeous and i love it so uh thank you our book club people what did you guys think about it though because i actually haven't talked to either of you guys about it i know um katie you go first well i'd already begun reading it a year ago when jimmy a work friend gave it to my husband um uh, to read because he was like this is one of my favorite books of all time you need to read this and Juan has not picked it up so we still have the book <laughs> sitting in the bedroom so anyway I um I started reading it and I was like wow this is like better than the Southern Reach trilogy not border <laughs> um, uh, it, it is it, no 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 it, there's a it, there's a certain level um, it's not better like as in storytelling or anything like that it is perfect listen I really enjoyed <laughs> this book I really enjoyed it I it, it was cozy and in a weird way it was atmospheric it it lulled me into a beautiful set, like I was being cradled but I have some issues I don't have any issues. It feels like like it feels um, exactly what it wanted to be is what it is. And I feel in that the perfection, not the perfection of the craft, but the perfection of the idea. And so um, I there's one part, there's one quote in particular, and I even screen capped it so that way when we get to that part, I can quote it that made me like. I've never it's so rare that you have a main character that's so lovable. And I just really, really, really like how genuine and innocent Piranesi, whatever. It's Piranesi. Uh, no. That's how it's pronounced. Piranesi. <laughs> also, let me just tell you, when it when, at one point when they, they threw in the phrase dishy young Italian, I really That's... got thrown. I got really I, thrown. I, the best part of this book. It's one of my favorite parts of this book because it... It just kept coming up and yeah. didn't know what it meant. And it, it's one of those things where, like, it, that is actually one of my favorite things about this book is that when he, uh, Piranesi first gets introduced to yeah. modern things, the absolute, like, uh, cognitive dissonance he's experiencing. And, yeah. and, like, these words have meaning, but he has no idea what they mean. And you, as the reader, ah, oh, I know, I love it when he's like... The dishy young Italian, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, who's the dishy young Italian? There are three of the dead. They could be whoever, whoever, and the dishy young Italian. Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and it just keeps going, and it's funny the whole time. Listen, it is a really good book, and all of my gripes that I'm going to have are going to be partially because I kind of wanted it to be longer. Oh, no, I didn't want it See, to be longer. I, I'm so happy it was short because it's exactly as long as it needed to be. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, like, Things move fast. If if this was longer, it would be more of him just alone in the house. And that I feel like would have been kind of deadly because it didn't bore me, but a lot of people it did apparently, the first like 25%. Um, and I could see how- I could see how, but it's such a shame. Yeah, the thing is, this is like a book if there were no secondary characters and secondary plot lines. And so it's just him and that's why it's short is, is kind of how I feel about the length. Cause it is very short, it's six hours on Audible where usually books are like, 
like closer to 12. Um, and so it, it's very short. And it actually even has longer falling action than I expected it to, um, which works stylistically, I think, but in a longer book wouldn't have. Also, I feel like if you did linger on him in the house a little bit more, there would be two things that would affect it negatively. One, the um, loneliness that he doesn't necessarily experience, but does, would I think if you made it longer, potentially become more poignant and taken away the peace nature of the home. Um, and because there's like that whole aspect of he is lonely, but he finds that enlight enlightenment. <laughs> it's, it, I, we've used the word four times before we got on here. Anyway, but talking about sex. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them. And uh, so I feel like you would have lost that. And then two, um, yeah, for sure the boring part. But also I just feel like unless there was more to the home, the theme of the book would have been lost. So I love how you both assumed that I wanted more of him alone in the house. No, I wanted more of the plot, baby. I wanted more of the mystery. I wanted more of the the what happened with Paul, Paul on Seance. I don't want it. Again. I understand, but what you were just talking about was him being alone in the house. No, but that's what I mean, though. Like, that's what would have occurred. He would have been alone in the house discovering No, see, things. I would have liked more of, like, other people coming in and, like, oh. uh, identities getting confused, his confusion of what he's being told. That's, like, so much, though. I don't want that. Again, I completely understand, but for me, unfortunately, at a certain point, this boy book felt a little I felt separate from the everything and part of this is just because he is separate everything he is learning happened years ago he is super isolated from any of the actual like things that happened and for me it felt like it was missing some body it was like a delicious pastry that I wanted a filling inside, but there it was a bit empty. Like like there was too little filling, and it, I just wanted. And a couple of other people have used the term body. So Miss Ali yeah. Snow said, "I, I wish it had had more body," but I think it was a good length, and that I agree with. But I did feel like I just wanted a little bit more. And it's not that I thought anything was bad. I just wanted more. It, it, again, using it as a pastry, where it's a delicious pastry, I just wanted a little bit more filling. As a side note, it, that's actually funny that you say that. It's because if you read her other piece. Uh, Norrell, um, then, or, you know, the whole title, but um, it's the same thing. She has the same style where you feel like there should be more body in it and more exploration. But I think it's like, her style is like this weird melancholic echo uh, every time you read a piece I of hers. It. And um, I think, again, I think you would lose it if you did that. It would be a different piece, which would be really fun for this story in particular, because it's there's a lot to it that could be explored, but then you wouldn't have what you have. I think I think it's I did finish it and feel like almost a little insubstantial. Mm -hmm. And like again, I really enjoyed reading it. I think it's a book that is saying what it's trying to say, but yeah, oh, the, the the lack of body to it I do kind of feel. Um but I'm I'm not sure how much yeah, it's interesting. I, I think part of it is I don't feel like it quite comes together in a thesis as well as it could. Um, and I wasn't sure if I was missing something. So this morning I went through looking through what other people have said about it. And I realized that our <gasps> podcast is way better than everybody else's because I could not like nobody else had a very good thematic reading on it. Mm -mm. So I'm not necessarily saying that like it doesn't come back to a thematic message. It may for for some people, but I felt like it was a little bit lacking in regards to like that that final full body feel. So Miss uh, Ali Snow says, I want a companion novel from Raphael's point of view. So uh, conceptually, like in a fan fiction mindset, yeah, yeah I'd like yeah. that, but I don't actually want that no. to be a thing within the world. That's, for me, Piranesi's uh, point of view is so much the heart of this and what makes it so charming and fantastic. And I, uh, one thing I don't want is I don't want a normal person's point of view when it comes to the house. I very much uh, take Piranesi's the house is a loving place that will take care. Like, I just, I, I loved his relationship with the house. I loved how it was home to him even after. Like, there's a lot of things I love. And again, when I say I wanted more, it's not that I think anything here was bad. There's just a few aspects I would have liked more to sink my teeth into, especially that. And so Lindbergh has, and in the uh, chat for the Discord, Lindbergh kept making a, a comment, and I'm going to read uh, something she said here. I feel that it was, uh, if it was longer, Clark would have had to com ha had to commit 
to whether this was a real place or an allegory. And I think either way, she would have lost half her readership. Um, and uh, the idea being, what is the house? What is that uh, dimension space? Does it have a, a concrete? I don't think necessary. Like, I mean, I see where you're coming from with that. But I, I don't think it's... I don't think the... I didn't see it as her trying to paint it as an allegory, though. Although I see that. I, I completely understand that because yeah. it isn't that. I, I mean, it is that too. But especially toward the the last chapter where it describes, like, where it really connects the whole concept of, like, the statues being representations of the filled concepts and ideas and desires of, like, real people. Um, but being, like, uh, uh, sieved into that place. Like... I, you know what, actually, you know what's funny is even though I don't want it in this book, I personally want to know where those other doorways went that what's his face saw, but decided not to go through when he was in his garden. That's what I want. I think that the book can't, to agree with Lindbergh, I don't think that the book can really expand much more than it does without becoming a different thing. Um, Angry Otter said, also, I prefer a book to do less than more because I assume anything added is going to fuck it up. Fuck yeah, yeah. I, that is actually my feeling as well. I think, honestly, if anything, I feel like the book maybe should have been a little bit shorter because I think it's in a little bit of an uncomfortable limbo between short story and novel in terms of that's why it feels a little thin, I think, to people is that it is a little bit too long to be a short story that really punches. Um I, th- all of this is like a little bit of a criticism, but like uh, this is easily going to go in our crisp tier at the end of the oh. year. Oh, Ab- it's one of the best books we've read, hands down. And it, it's one of the best books we've read outside of a genre. Like it's not our usual bag, you know, like this, this, this uh, channel has a, a, mm-hmm. a vibe. Girl books for girls. Fantasy books for fantasy girls. Bro, and wait this- a second. Okay, can we just say, I love this one. This book is like a non whore backrooms meets Total Recall. That's like literally <laughs> so exactly the way it is. <laughs> I I know exactly what both of those two things are. Total Recall is <laughs> a movie of, where you re- forget things. Uh, no, no, don't tell her. If she doesn't know, she has to live with her ignorance and shame. I have zero shame. It's like she's never watched The Godfather. I've watched The Godfather, you son of a bitch. I would just say crisp and buttery since it's this little self-indulgent. I don't know that I would say it's indulgent. I would not say say self-indulgent, angry otter. (laughs) (laughs) Let's all like back up a little bit. We didn't mean to all pile on at you at once. No, no, no. So I wouldn't, I can understand why for, just because based on what angry otter's comments were in the discord, why it would feel self-indulgent. Again, for me, because I felt like I didn't have enough filling it doesn't feel indulgent i'm like any more please uh and and so that's why for me indulgent isn't a term i would use what i would say is it is into its idea and it is committing to the bit like this this writer commits hard to the bit and if it is not your bit it is you're probably gonna have a hard time. So the what literally the uh, um so like the majority of the book was really enjoyable to read and everything, and that was fine and everything. But <clears throat> I think sorry about that. That's like my thing shifting. Let me move it to the side. Um, anyway, uh, but what I really, 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 really like was like uh um a moment where as a writer I was like I need to adopt that. Uh, is the the part where. Uh, Raphael comes along and is like, you know, Matthew, blah, 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 blah. And then he's like, no, I'm not him, but he's sleeping inside me and I'm taking care of him. And uh, because I take care of the dead, which is the quote I love. And it's like the concept of so much trauma that instead of like this kidnapped person who's been traumatized coming back and trying to become the old version of them, they instead become like a genesis of two souls that have now become a completely new growth, which is the only real, in my opinion, like happiness after such a traumatic event. Like it's because no matter what, when you go through that trauma, you're going to have PTSD and like relive shit and everything. But in this version of like this explanation of this trauma, like he's instead become something better out of it. Like 
And I like that so much. I don't know. I mean, I, I understand your saying of it, but to me, it still felt sad. Like there, there's an extent to which everyone who, who all the reviews I looked up of this said like, oh, you're supposed to at first feel sorry for him, but then realize that like he's kind of grown more. And as much as whoever thinks he's pathetic, he's actually quite more spiritual. And I'm like, no, I still think it's kind of sad. What happened? Like it is I, sad. I kind of, I think it's sad, and I don't think he's like a better, more enlightened no, person now. He's not. He's, he's just, just a more empathetic one, right? And I, I get that after grief, that's like the best you can kind of expect for in a certain um way. Angry Otter had a really interesting reading on um our closing thoughts channel about how the book can kind of function as an allegory for gender identity, um, because Angry Otter is is uh non-binary. And they were talking about oh, um, interesting how yeah, in terms of like the house, but also in terms of like that sense of who the person is. There's Mac, Fume, Rose, whoever, whatever, um, and that's one the person everybody wants them to be. Matthew Rose Sorensen. It's a very easy game. Wait, that name. Uh, game? Oh, <laughs> game? Name. Name. Game? It's, it's Ma- very Matthew, easy to pronounce Matthew, game. Matthew Rose Sorensen. That's kind of like the, the previous person. And then Piranesi is also a person. You kind of have to integrate those identities. And specifically that the body you're in feels... It is a vessel, but it is not you, which is something I actually uh, empathize with a lot. And that happens to me a lot more when I was young, too, is just a lot of body dysmorphia, not along gender lines, but just in general. I was always struck by the arbitrarity of being in this body versus another. Um, And so I thought that it it is definitely interesting in that respect. Um, I don't know how much the book really deals with. See, the thing is that I think it ends. The book ends a little bit too late because once you start having him go back to the the real world and have to deal with the repercussions of everything that happened to him, it feels like they didn't quite go far enough there. It kind of felt a bit of a yada yada, and now I'm re um, reintegrating. Whereas I would have liked it if the book had just ended with him making the decision to go back to the real world or the our world but then you miss the message that comes afterwards like this like there are several mess like several maybe not messages but there are several things that happen afterwards that make me feel like it's completed because we got afterwards i think that's very much also the author's project is that yeah. you know it wasn't a book where i was like oh great we have the scouring of the shire Oh, great. Another ending. Like, you know, like yeah. that typical ending, at least in the movies. I, I can't remember from the books if it feels like that. It did feel like, oh, OK, this is a book whose pace can afford a very long uh, falling action. And I was interested in the falling action. It felt like it was building um, to something. But I think that's why to me it feels a little bit thin at times is because it starts hinting at another story of reintegration, but it doesn't quite get there so i i get that because i kind of had that as well like there was a moment where i was like there's only 10 minutes left i i felt like the reintegration but then for me i had i i agree with katie in that for me the idea because fundamentally for me at the heart of this is the house as a place where ideas concepts uh traditions go to die once we are done using them or once they have kind of fallen out of the vogue. And I like the idea of him being able to understand and digest our world through these older visions. I I think one of the most beautiful descriptions is the one he uses for Dr. Kettering, where it's the man with the sword and the spear and he's broken the spear to understand it, but has simultaneously broken the sword and he's just sitting there holding the spear. (laughs) Everything is useless, but he's like, maybe if I put it back together, it'll mean something. And in the the process of doing it has destroyed the tool that he had. Like everything is destroyed by trying to understand this other thing through destruction. And that for me was just an incredible and like, perfect encapsulation of his character um and i i think that's what i mean when i want more is that was such a compelling moment and put kettering into perspective but i wish i would have gotten more from him and felt from him that sadness and that terrible like tragedy of what he has done to his life from him as an actual character like i didn't get that from him prior to that we're talking about lawrence right no, not Lawrence. Um, uh, uh, Valentine, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, but I feel, you know what? I really felt like I received that, though. Um, especially in um, the the s- scene where we get where um, Matthew actually goes to his place initially. Like, that entire scene defined that statue. It, without that, I the statue wouldn't have felt so um, 
Like, I mean, it would have made sense in like, a, oh, I get it. But like, it wouldn't have felt so keenly represented. It's that scene that really makes him seem like a melancholic, mad, disgusting pathetic creature i can see that but for me that scene is more the decision to break the spear with the sword and it isn't the aftermath like we don't get to see his aftermath of reeling realizing that he has broken every like what he wanted he has broken both things but we do we it's the the whole him trying to solve the issue of the incantation and the him trying like he's like grasping at nothing yeah but it didn't feel melancholic that, that my point is that oh it did to me melon that bittersweet melancholia that you get out of the end, he felt just very practical and functional in those scenes. Like, no, from ah, Piranesi's yes, from Piranesi's perspective, it seemed like really like not belittle from another person belittling, but um like this creature that doesn't know what it's doing is trying so very hard to grasp at logic, but he can't get it. And he won't. It's because he doesn't as uh uh the uh I can only remember the first names for some reason, but Lawrence, um, like Lawrence said, he can only ever steal other people's ideas. So like from that, and then from the, the back to back where like Piranesi is like, what about this? And he's like, Oh my God, that's such a great idea. Yeah, let's do that. Like, it really seems like a really sad imitation of what he wants to be, but can't actually, because he's not smart enough to be it. In retrospect. Yes. But unfortunately, like that conversation with Lawrence happens after we see him doing all of that stuff. So yeah, as I was reading it, as I was reading it, it didn't read that way. In retrospect, with the knowledge I have now, yes, absolutely. But in the initial reading, it didn't. And I would have liked it to come up more. Like, I would have liked him to feel a bit more sad and lost or just, like, feel a bit more like he doesn't, he is plugging ahead on a broken path. And I didn't feel like that in the initial. And part of that is because Piranesi thinks he's great, thinks he's super smart, thinks he's being logical. <laughs> I was actually a little, not surprised. Okay, so I wasn't surprised, but when he became the villain, I was like, oh, okay. Because there's an extent to which I originally read him as kind of bumbling and like um, not sinister so much as maybe like a little pig headed, and but he was going to still keep going. You know what I mean? I didn't think he was going to yeah. turn on to an outright villain. And so, yeah, there's a lack of that tragedy to me in him. A couple of comments, though. Um, so, uh, where did it go? It was Celia who said it also needed that last chapter to show how Matthew and Perinese coexisted, but there was a new third person as well. OK, so that's actually exactly what I was talking about, because I think that that is the problem is that we're introduced to a new person in the last falling action, that third person. And so we're not really able to see the integration of those two people into a third one. We're just kind of told that it happens and then that it will continue to happen. And I think that to me is what I was talking about in terms of that falling action, opening a new chapter that doesn't really get built through. Um, and another one is that Valerie says, I think this is one of those books that's hard to review because there are so many different takeaways and readings it can have. And like, I think that is very true in that I think because, um, you know, Lindbergh throughout this whole thing has been typing up a thing about how she feels like it was um, the whole thing might have just been an allegory to an extent um, in his mind. Um, and that might be one of the readings. And I think that's one of the reasons it feels a little thin at times is because it's not quite um, making an argument it's kind of it, it it's hard because there are so many readings it's hard to grasp one and feel like it fully fulfills the book i think um and and that's kind of an interesting because none of them are incoherent but all of them feel a little at odds almost it's at sea i really like well, I, maybe it's because i've never really finished anything but i like I don't know what the uh, vibe, I guess. I don't know. I vibe with stories like this. And like, there was another one that we read too, where it, we, you guys had um, like, n not the same, obviously, but there was like commentary being made similarly as to like, there was like, maybe it was just you and me, Will, I don't remember. But there was like a discussion had at some point where it was like, it felt like kind of empty and ghostly or something. But that's a style for me. And I, I, I like that. And I and there's something to that that brings out other things that would be really fun to discuss at some point. But there's a certain I don't know how to explain it. I would have to think about it. I think you're oh, right. I remember that, that conversation. I can't remember the book, but I remember because I was saying the descriptions weren't solid enough. I never understood where I was, and I used the word 
ephemeral. And you were like, exactly. That's exactly what I want. And I was like, no, no, no. It was like gray blank space behind. Yeah, exactly. Like, That's oh, what I want. Right. Which <laughs> book was that? I can't remember now. We should probably jump into the plot and then we can discuss as we go. Um, let's leave a pause here in case we have a sponsor in the future for this video. Oh, oh sorry. I was told to yell anymore. <laughs> oh, hello. I didn't hear you come in. You caught me just in the middle of a book I have here called The Witch Awakening. In fact, the author Karen Nielsen is the sponsor of this video. Here's a quote about it from Rapid River Arts and Culture Review. The mark of a great fantasy novel is, can it enthrall readers like me who don't like fantasy novels? I'm happy to say I thoroughly enjoyed The Witch Awakening. The characters are full bodied, the dialogue is terse and irreverent, the action is exciting and clever, and the book, all 414 pages of it, not a boring moment. Kiss the flame. Love defies family, king, religion, even death itself in a skewed renaissance world of witch burnings, sword fights, and court intrigue. The odor of burning flesh and the screams of those condemned to the flames disturb the dreams of young Sapphire of Longmarsh. Sapphire struggles to keep the curse of her psychic ability secret lest she be burned at the stake as a witch in her native land, Cormelan. Forced to keep her talents hidden instead of learning how to use them, Sapphire is ill-prepared to face the evil that awaits her. When she meets the rebellious Marius of Landers, a noble man determined to escape his overbearing father's influence, she finally finds someone who accepts her. But their romance interferes with court plots and family duty, and ultimately leads Sapphire to confront the dark secrets of the House of Landers alone. What she finds there proves to be a test of her unusual gifts, a test that could free the soul of a haunted man or end in her death. The Witch Awakening is available in ebook and print format from a variety of online retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple, Kobo, and many more. If you're curious about Sapphire's story and want to learn more, please visit Reluctant Phoenix YouTube channel, where you'll find audio excerpts from the novella Prequel, Fledgling Witch, and The Witch Awakening. Now scurry along and enjoy the rest of the video. So this book uh, is a man in a giant house of cavernous rooms with windows i almost imagined it like because it the windows don't feel like they have actual glass in them just like a giant massive house of pillars like arched pillars just one on top of the other and then uh different uh rooms and antechambers and sections of it that is connected to the it is ocean on the bottom and then sky, and then some livable space. And basically, this is a... You start the book, and you're a bit at sea. Oh! oh, oh, oh. I see what you did there. With what is happening, because you're like, is this just a giant? What? What is this space? And we have a, a man, Piranesi, who is narrating to us. And he describes himself as like 34-ish, um, but there is an innocence in his observations. And the basic idea of Piranesi is he tracks the tides to make sure that he can get in and out of rooms and places. He adventures the spaces of the house and he loves it. The house is filled with statues. Every different room, corridor, antechamber has different kinds of statues. Um, and he has memorized the locations and there are thousands of rooms in this house and he has gone at one point he describes how far he's gone in either direction uh to try explore and there are even caverns that are he calls the drowned rooms because they're just completely uh filled with water and just broken down and derelict um and he he fishes he eats seaweed a, a lot of seaweed seaweed comes up a lot there's a lot of <laughs> things this man tries to do with seaweed i want you to know that when he first was describing his diet and he was like uh uh you know like talking about the fish skins and the fish paste and the seaweed i was like wait a second but realistically he would have had gout 
I don't understand <laughs> what would have. And then it's like later on multivitamins. And I was like, oh, that makes sense now. Thank you for that. I'm very glad that was included. I did yeah. wonder about that too, actually. That's funny. Or even, uh, what is it called? Um, that that sailors get that they have to eat oranges for? Scurvy. Gout I is remember. different. What I meant was scurvy. Scurvy? But yeah. I said gout. Yeah. Instead. Close enough. <laughs> and his days have like a quiet kind of rhythm to them of the exploration, getting his meals, cooking it. And you are at loss. You were at a loss originally about like, does he have pots and pans? Like what, what level of technology, what level of like life is he living in this space? And then we meet the other, what you learn from Piranesi is it is him, like 13 dead people. And then the other, and the other shows up in a suit pants and a tie shoes and you're like well in the second meeting of the other when it was like today he was wearing a and i was like i'm sorry did he i like because initially i was picturing that they had traveled to this location together and were stuck together or i don't know what was happening exactly i was like did he take a luggage with him and in what way and why does he have all this cool shit the way the book on uh reveals and and kind of unravels the world as you go and gives you information on it is actually really masterful because you do originally get the sense of like okay this is all of the world you know and then that is how piranesi will really treat the this uh, area, like at one point later when he hears about our world, he's like, are there a lot of people there? And they're like, yeah. And he picks an incredibly large number. And he's like, are there 70, 70 people, people. There? And she's like, I think a few more. <laughs> but, um, and so when, when the other shows up, initially you think he's part of this world that Piranesi exists in. And then like little by little, you're like, no, he isn't. He he has like a suit. And where does he go after this? And like, how does he have multivitamins that he gives him? And like that I thought was like very nicely done. Because the book really is sort of structured almost as like a mystery at times in terms it of is. what is going on, who is who. There's a, a good amount of suspense and tension in it. There's really something to be learned from like, well, there's a lot of writing things to learn from this book. Um, but one thing in particular is it just you can make it work if your narrator believes it and you just need to make them convict like really convicted in their beliefs that this is just part of life but not just that it, it can't just be because i have read books where the narrator believes something but the surrounding things around the narrator like the world itself doesn't but because they're journal articles the whole thing is like but for me it's also the descriptions of the place you you actually get a pretty robust idea of what this looks like of the space of what life is like um and it, it's that for me is what makes it work because you are so you have no idea what this world is and so you start immediately questioning you're immediately looking at things she makes you as much as like and because you're I, I immediately i was like okay so this has a house it has doors it has statues is this our world is this another world this guy's wearing a suit and so you're piecing it together and it's it's very well done because piranesi is not in on the mystery at all <laughs> he is not there he is vibing just straight up vibing with his muscles and seaweed soup for breakfast. But Will's right. The introduction of the other and how it starts you questioning. Cause I also had the exact same thing where I was like, these two guys are lost here. And I thought the other was like a hermit man who like had a, like a cluster mm -hmm. of rooms that were always dry. And he had like some books in there and he didn't let Piranesi in there. Cause God forbid he touched his stuff. Yeah. That's exactly the way I picture. I thought it was like, I, I mean, I didn't know what to expect. Cause I didn't read the summary or anything. And so um, when I went into it, I was like, is this like the end of the world apocalypse time? And this is all that remains of the world. And he's like hoarded all the normal modern day stuff. And I was literally like, is this an abandoned museum? Well, no, I didn't say that, but yes. And in the very beginning, I was like, is this what it is? Like, cause I was trying to figure out if it was an apocalypse setting. What yeah, that was my thought too. Building? And I was like, and then when he starts describing how big it is, I was like, nope, that's not it. And so you're really just piecing. But at the same time, I need to emphasize how this book lulls you into a rhythmic sense of just just like the ocean peace. waves it really does it is like it you read and like because 
there are points where not much is actually happening. <laughs> like, it's just pure nazi being like, I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to look for this. And but you know what? There's something really satisfying about the logical nature of him being like, I must do A, B, and C. So I do the A, B, and C because I have to survive. I don't know. Just the way she writes it is very, like... It is soothing. This book was yeah. fucking soothing. Yeah. I don't know. How, it's great. It's fantastic. I think um, that's where some people's boredom came in with the book. And I kind of, I get that. But for me, A, it was not that long. And B, I always am really interested in world building when it's interesting. And that's essentially what this book is doing on a very small scale is world building, this very small area in detail. Um, and so like Piranesi will talk about like, when a gull arrived, and that's how he names his years by things that happened. The year the albatross came to the southwestern hall. Yeah, that's the the entry of um because this is written as a diary in first person, which may I say the best use one of the best uses of first person we've had. It, it's amazing to me that both this and Akawa are in first person and that they're allowed to be. And when okay, my you. author you bar, bar association is founded, we're not going to allow that kind of thing anymore. Um, but yeah, it's really used masterfully. And um, and so there, there are moments where like that happens where he kind of like talks to the birds and they kind of interact back and forth. Um, that really only work because you're so centered in his viewpoint. I completely Thanks respect I that it's not for everyone, but I love watching the guy get excited about birds. I <laughs> and, know! He really thinks like he can talk to them and he's like, right, the birds are kind of talking back. It's just, and there's one point later where he's super rushed and, is, and in a hurry and he's like, okay, birds, I can't talk to you today. And he just goes, I by. can't have a long conversation, guys. <laughs> it's and, so funny. And I think one of the most beautiful scenes that I almost nearly teared up in was when the albatross was coming in and he was standing and he was like, I'm ready. And he was like, like we can become, the, the albatross is going to become one with him. And it was just such a beautiful, like, that is one of the themes of this book is Piranesi is able to see the beauty in this place. And and uh, Kettleberg, who we'll get to in a minute, I don't think his name is Kettleberg. Um, his- Kettering? Kettering, um, who we'll get to and talk about in a minute, can't, he just sees it as a means to an end. And the author is really able to sell Piranesi's love of this world and his appreciation of its beauty. Um, and we get that. Cause again, towards like towards the middle, I was like, this is such a beautiful place in a way. Um, it, I don't know if there was something a little video gamey about it to me in a way. Ketterly. In that, like, there it is. Ketterly. Because like, you could almost just imagine like exploring this as a, as a place, uh, as like a real 3d environment that I thought was really cool. I actually completely forgot about the birds prophesizing his lost innocence. Yeah. That's a really good point. Hazel oh, Beans. and fine man says missed. And I think they mentioned that before. Yeah. This book has such major mist vibes. I love. Like, it. wait, mist is in like the mist. Uh, no, the video game. Oh, uh, you poor baby birds! You're too young to know about mist. Shut the fuck up about baby birds and video gaming. I play. I've played a lot of indie video games. Rule of Rose is not a normal game that most. People I think know. maybe you guys should go back to your analysis of the Winx Club. And from there, I think that's maybe a little more on your level. Are you talking about me? Both of you. It's the little birds who have come to the great eagle to learn. Again, I have no shame. I don't play <laughs> video games. I don't give a shit. Uh, it's a very old point and click adventure game that I grew up on and that it's like, it's very, um, there, there's a real sense of f f tension and, and like loneliness to it. It's, it's a... It's not a great game, but the sense of tension to it and, and loneliness is like really beautiful in a way. And this book kind of reminded me and other people about it a little bit. Um, but you were saying about the Winx Club, Maria. Anyway, but <laughs> Katie's right. And uh, who was it? I think it was uh, Hazel Phoenix. Yes. Uh, who mentioned the birds predict the book, don't they? He lost his innocence. Like that entire. And I was waiting like the whole time to see how the birds would predict this. And it's it's fascinating. Like I said, we get introduced as we're put into Piranesi's life and what he goes through, we get introduced to the other. And the other, he meets with the other on uh, Tuesdays and Fridays at 10 um, in a certain hall uh, that he goes and he meets with him uh, in and they discuss their their research and their studies. And the thing they're trying to discover is this great power and knowledge that uh the other says is something that humanity lost in the uh in trying to pursue progress and you get the sense that Piranesi does not know what this means in the 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 idea of progress uh because in his world like 
order. There is no real progress. Things happen every day the same way that they happened before. But he parrots a lot of things that the other says. And so you definitely get the idea that the other is someone who has some influence on him. And specifically, the powers that the other wants are to control people's minds, to become invisible, and to be able to soar as a bird, which are like such weird, random things that you figure no. out later why. But like, it was so funny to me initially. And that's why I think maybe I thought he was a little more bumbling than well, he that's was. What I, that's what I was going to say is that it, it really shows his lack of creativity. Yeah, no, and because literally later on, um, I think Arn Sales says something about like, oh, these are the powers the ancients had, and those are exactly the ones Kettleback, that's his not, not his name, wants. Just keep making up names, it's fine. Kettle something, I remember that much. Kettering! Ketterly, Ketterly. Someone, I think it was Celia who mentioned that Ketter is heretic in uh, Dutch. Yeah, no, the names here aren't subtle, like the savior character is named Raphael. Um, which obviously is from Street Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's an interesting uh, literary illusion there. Um, okay, yeah, no, and the other, again, I originally I thought he was a little bit bumbling, which is actually probably a good place to start the character and then reveal more of the sinisterness beneath, but he clearly has these things, and he clearly looks down on Piranesi a little bit, but Piranesi is helping him, again, with their research, which was very funny that, like, they're looking at this abstract place as so... Um, like grounded concrete yes and and piranesi the types of research he does is he'll take photos for ketterly uh, and he doesn't call him ketterly he just calls him the other and it's just because for him it's the other person here that is it like that is there it, he does not conceive a world where there is more than two people he knows that there had to be more because there's a room with a bunch of dead people in it um and then there's a guy in a biscuit box and then there's a, a, the hidden person and um the folded up child is who you're referencing no 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 the hidden person there's literally the oh that one the one that he can't get out without yeah 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 he calls it something else but it's the hidden like how i remembered it is the hidden person um and uh he takes photos for the other he um tracks the tides and this is something he does for himself uh, partially for survival because rooms can randomly flood um but also for the other to help the other like feel calm about the the space that he's in um also what was the shining thing that he had it was a smartphone yeah i was gonna say is it a smartphone is it a, a computer i kept thinking about that as soon as it just he described it, i was like oh so he has a smartphone and then i was like oh so he can go outside. And then once later on, it confirmed it. I was like, okay, this makes a lot more sense. Um, why he's like never there and he's meeting him on specific days and why he hasn't gone mad and why he has to says he has to go and all that stuff. I literally at one point thought, this is how much my brain was like, what's what's happening here? <laughs> that it was like a, it was a different world and that he had like, he lived on the fringes, that the other lived on the fringes of this and had trades people. Oh my God, you went hardcore. Yeah. Oh no, seriously. I, at every point, and, and, and I say that and yet this was so lulling and peaceful for me so like my i the mind she do what she do look i thought initially i was like is the character a satire or not because on the cover there's a satire and so i was like i kind of just expected the character to be one for some reason um so no i totally get it and the thing is i think the book accepts that that you're just not going to quite know what's going on um and again i kept thinking it was post-apocalyptic for a while and then pretty early on i think i clued into what was going on when he mentions like better see but so i listened to the audiobook the majority of the time and i unfortunately could not focus this week. So I had to re-listen to multiple points of the book upwards of eight times. Um, so this book took me a lot longer than six hours to listen to. Um, but anyway, uh, I had to re-listen to the beginning several times. And so it was easy to remember the intro um, about the in-between places. So that's why it was easy to connect it really quickly, what was happening. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it, it's... Again, I think it's actually, it's really done well. And again, the the precision of the ordinariness of that Piranesi knows about the house is really cool and really well done. I'm glad Will and I are not the only ones with weird hypotheses of what was going on. Hazel Phoenix says, I thought Piranesi was a minotaur because the house was a labyrinth. Celia oh, cool. said, I for a moment thought Ketterly was a 
part of the house too and didn't really exist but was a concept. oh my god y'all went so hard i think the but it's, it's supposed to it's supposed it, to yeah, yeah it you're supposed to be sitting there thinking what is this how do i put it together because she does the reveal so slowly and bit by bit well yeah it's not supposed to be like immediately noticeable i just like i don't know i just i just fig- I, I just figured it out at a certain point i've started figuring it out too and it was i was almost a little disappointed by how mundane things ended up being and that like there was a normal world and like this one had just been there and so I, I don't know how much of the plot we want to go into because there actually isn't a lot that happens per se. Yeah, I'll, I'll go over it really quickly. Basically, the other comes to him one day and is like, hey, if anyone else ever tries to talk to you, you need to. And he's like 16. And I'm going to explain the dead really quick because I love this as a concept. There are a bunch of bones that he has discovered throughout the uh, house um, and he has taken care of them, put them in good order, and they live in their places, and he goes and he brings them food and offerings, and he talks to them and engages with them, um, and it's very sweet, but he has them, like, uh, depending on what's around them or what they are, so there's a, a child that's kind of, like, folded up that feels like a young girl, and he has a, a weird... <clears throat> he thinks that it was originally that child female who was was meant for him as a wife so that they they could continue because he's like the house wants people to be here to observe its beauty and he's like i could have we could have made a, a another person but then something must have happened but um because of this for him in the world there are only like 13 people uh including the other or no 15 people including the other and so when uh the other mentioned someone else he's like oh 16 and the other's like what and he's like there's 15 people here. The other is such a, like, he really just, it's so depressing how much he belittles Piranesi and how, to the point where he doesn't even acknowledge what he's going through or what he's saying. Like, he's not even listening. Yeah, a lot of time he's not even listening. It makes total sense that he would call it number 16 because he's talked about it so many times. And he says, oh, yeah, so I've talked about it many times. And it's like, wow, you didn't even, but that makes total sense considering the premise of why he's even there in the first place. But like, uh, oh my God, didn't he seem, a side note, didn't he seem like such a like old, like cackling witch when he was like, this was just opportune. I needed a young man. <laughs> I, I liked how not cackling he was most of the time in the book. Like there are parts where he's kind of nice to, to Piranesi. He's not as like cackling as a lot of the characters we've read in books that we even liked have been. No, but when he first entraps him. Yeah, though that part was funny Like to me. That was like, okay. You know who, by the way, this audiobook narrator is so good. Chew oh. with hell, tells you for. Oh, that was oh, him? Oh my God, God really? Yes. Motherfucker! I was sitting there and I was like, at one point I was like, let me go back and read, listen to the, because it just happened so fast in the beginning when they say the narrator's name and I listened to it again and I was like, oh my god, it's fucking Chuatel. Like, he's incredible. He's amazing. The way he does Arn Sales, there's a jowliness to his voice. Yeah. And I know! Can, it's so creepy and, and intimidating the way this old man is just saying these words one after another and you're like oh what shit. a great voice actor i mean I, you i think he does voice act for several animations too so that makes sense it was just incredible i his performance is one of the things that made this as magical as it was it yeah and honestly i think that's true because for me it was easy just to listen to his voice mm -hmm. and like there's something about his voice that was just likable and like soft and like yeah no so it's it's yeah he he really kicked it that makes so much sense now the other tells him that somebody else is going to be coming and that this other person wants to is his is the other's enemy and would like to kill him and so don't talk to the other or don't talk to 16 because they will try they um and originally it's just they're gonna kill me so you have to hide um, and eventually Piranesi does interact with a different person, but it is not 16. Um, it is someone that Piranesi refers to as the prophet. And it is an old man who comes in. And this happens after, I do have to explain this. There's a point where a, the other comes and says, hey, I need to ask you some questions. How, what, how much do you remember? And Piranesi is like, I remember everything. Dude. I know where all the statues is. I know all the ties. I got it all up here. And he's like, what do you remember about Battersea? And Piranesi's like, 
that means nothing. You have said a nonsense word to see if I was going to pretend to remember it <laughs> yeah. so you could verify if I actually remembered the stuff I said I remembered. You have not fooled me. And the other is like, exactly. You have hit the nail on the head, my boy. Um, anyway, so that happens. The other fucks off. And then it, it, they have the conversation about 16 and don't, like, heck and bad person, don't talk to them. And then uh, he finds someone else. And it's not 16. It is a different person. Piranesi's world is blowing up. So, so many new peeps. And this person basically uh, kind of confirms what we've thought, which is in that moment where he asks him about Battersea, we as readers know that Battersea is an actual place. Oh, I did not know that was an actual place. I had no idea what that meant. Yeah, I, 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 I did. I was well, like, yeah, I know. Oh, it's yeah. because you're not, like, you know, normal. So I knew, I knew it was an actual place. And so I was like, oh, there is history here that he does not want him to remember. And, it, like, it adds to that heightened... Because, again, these tiny little crumbs she's leaving for you to put together what the story is doing. Then you meet this other person. It's an old guy... With red... Wet lips. That everybody keeps describing as red and wet. <laughs> it comes up multiple times. I don't understand. Okay, look. <laughs> wait, wait a second. <laughs> Natura, Natura. I was just being silly. All I meant is that she was more cultured. That's all I really <laughs> actually wow, Katie, meant. Plenty of normal people live in Battersea. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I knew it was, I didn't know it was a real place, but I got that it, he was referencing something that was real. It wasn't like a test. It was some other thing. Yeah, I thought it was a play on words as well. Also, side note back when i was the only part that really threw me hard was the early like immediately first chapter or second chapter on it was like when it was describing the faun and uh or whatever and it was like he had an image of a young girl walking with a faun in the snow and i was like what the fuck is this place why is it referencing narnia i don't understand what's happening <laughs> yeah chronicles of narnia they referenced it yep. i thought that was pretty cool again i like it as the and i i like it as an analog for literature and tropes in literature that's how i think of the house like just a collection of uh ideas and and literary analogs but anyway um so he has this conversation and basically in this he learns that the other is named ketterly that 16 is not actually coming for ketterly but is coming for piranesi that's who they're coming for and then um uh that uh ketterly or has no unique ideas all of his ideas were his and then he just starts talking about some random people and one of which is the dishy young italian which will continue to plague this narration in the best way possible for the rest of the book i really felt bad for the dishy young italian as well as poor young james ritter james ritter There's a lot the, of people to Sil feel bad for yeah sylvia, was that sylvia, yeah, sylvia. Barler skinny yeah uh, Bar dogostino Sylvia yeah. Dogostino. I love the I love the description of her short film because uh, it's such a like artsy European. I don't know if it's a real one or not, but it feels so artsy European. It did. I thought it was. I was like, oh, this is probably real, and because uh, <laughs> it just sounded like it. Like yep. it's all metaphorical and very yeah. neo pagan, and like you could really picture it. Um, yeah. The other thing to mention that we haven't is that uh, all of this again is written as um, Piranesi writing in his book, but he has a bunch of. Um, uh diaries and he actually keeps like an index of what happens in in what pages on the diary and stuff and that'll become important later i'm actually going to jump to it right now because after he has this conversation with this man um he uh goes to record he refers to him as the prophet because he's speaking he's telling him things he's old he's he seems wise and he's telling him things that he didn't know and doesn't fully understand with a lot of words that don't make sense so obviously this dude must be a prophet again Piranesi only knows how to understand his world through the things that he like sees and interacts with um and then there's other things that uh he doesn't realize he doesn't actually have a reference for it yet, but he knows what they are. And it's fascinating because you as the reader are like, why do you know what that is? If you don't know what this other thing is and it's great. But anyway, he goes to record the conversation with the prophet. Um, he writes it down. He ends up having another conversation with Ketterly. Who's like actually 16. And he says, he's such a dick. He's like 21. Isn't here for me. They're I here know. for you. And he's like, who's talking Again, on? he doesn't yeah. give two flying fucks <laughs> yeah. about and this And Piranesi's like, do you mean 16? <laughs> like, what are you talking about in 21, you dick? Have we mentioned that um, the other's goal is to do a ritual and that- Vaguely, um, get, the, vaguely. get the power and the knowledge yeah. thing. And specifically at one point he says that late, and farther into the, the 
uh, the back rooms. They that he wants to do a ritual there because you can see a certain star or whatever. And Piranesi has a he goes, you know, the the library has but not the library. For some reason, I think of the house as a library, and I don't know why. He's like, you know, I realized while I was there looking it, that we should stop searching for this magical power and we should just look at the house and understand its beauty. And the other is like, God damn it. Okay, Piranesi, sit down. This is not the first time this has happened. You keep forgetting things. And Piranesi's like, no, I don't. And the guy's like, no, you keep forgetting things. This has happened three or four times. It's going to happen again. And you should trust me for these and these reasons. And it's very funny because later Piranesi's like, I think maybe he was forgetting things. <laughs> like Maybe he's going insane. I'm and not going he, insane. As a side note, uh, the, I just really love the ineptitude of... Uh, of the other when it's the whole point right is that like we discussed before oops, sorry um like we discussed before he is following after his teacher's footsteps because he doesn't have the creativity to come to any conclusions of his own so he goes there and he wants to invoke that power right or whatever which is so bizarre it's because like again at this point in your life why do you even want that power like all these powers that you've listed don't even like even matter but whatever that's neither here nor there Piranesi like is like yeah he was like I was thinking about these powers the only ones I'd want is to turn into a bird why do I need to be invisible there's no one else around number one there are no lesser minds it's just me and you and we are both top tier minds yes uh, and also why would you want to control other people that just like that just sounds like no blame no. and i just mm -hmm. love that so the whole the point is is that he was invoking this old um it comes up later but uh the the other was invoking this old uh seer uh name that it, it doesn't matter the point is is that he thought that that had power and then he was like ah well i guess that doesn't have power what can i do do i just make up a name and just th like it has to have power and of course piranesi's like intelligent so he's just like a star it has energy and so he's like but we can't see the stars and he's like no we, we, there's a place you could see the stars it's like forever away and you're too cowardly to go see it but i mean i've been there and then one of the biggest points and then this is really why i'm pointing this out is this part and it really just as soon as this happened i was like i hate the other and i want him to fucking eat shit is when um period he was like well go there, go, go see if you can see the stars and tell me because I'm not going to go. And he's just like, well, I can't because there's a whole bunch of sharp things on the ground because of the tides. And he's like, so fucking go walk. I don't care. Well, you did it before <laughs> you could, yeah, you can do it again. And he's like, and, and Pyrenees is embarrassed. And he's like, I don't have shoes anymore. They, they, I haven't had shoes in a while. And then he's like, oh, that's easy to fix. And then I'm like, bro, you're bringing him multivitamins and all this stupid ass shit. And yet- You wouldn't bring him new clothes at any point. Like Pyrenees is out here in sea washed rags. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> like, why didn't he bring him replacement clothes? He's trying to, like, there's this whole point uh, uh, in the book where he's describing surviving winter there. And I'm like- I'm sorry. You had, you just, what if he died because of the winter? Just like literally pure logic. Why didn't you bring him winter clothes? And it's, that's how dumb, insensitive, and the foil of Piranesi, apathetic he is towards others. Piranesi is trying to attempt to tell the other that he had a conversation with the prophet, but I, uh, Keter, uh, the other, the way he's talking about it, he's, Piranesi's like, maybe I'm not going to mention this. Because what the other is saying is slightly contradicting what the prophet said. And it is after this point where Piranesi goes back and he's working on uh, cataloging. So he's written up the diary entry for the conversation with the prophet as much as he can, word for word. Um, but now he is going in and he's going to, he has a separate book that is just a reference. So if he wants to look up something in any of his journals where he might have written it. He can go here, he can look under O, and he can find it. And he goes and he's putting in someone whose last name was like Offenmeyer or something. It's an O last name. And he goes to write an entry for it. And he thinks this is the first time. He's never heard this name before. It's gibberish to him. And he goes to write it in. And he sees that there are already two references in his reference book to points in his journals. One of which is for a journal that doesn't exist. Um, cause it says like, uh, uh, this entry, uh, these pages in, uh, the like 18th journal. And he's like, there's not 18 journals. I only have nine journals. 
And he begins to look into it and he finds that, yes, there are entries that he wrote that he doesn't remember writing that reference people that the prophet talked about. The prophet is uh, this like anthropologist slash occultist guy slash uh, weird thinker dude named Lawrence Arnsales. <laughs> we'll talk about him. There is, I still don't understand uh, some, like, he's interesting. But anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and he realizes that not only are there these entries about these people that make no sense to him, they have words he doesn't understand. It's literally like reading something written by a completely different person, but it's in his handwriting. But he realizes that the first three of his novel or not his novels, his journals were originally books, uh, 21 or, uh, yeah, books 21, like, 22, 23. No. Yeah, and somebody has scratched away painstakingly the two, so now it just looks like journal one, two, and three, and he has restarted from there. There's also a shift, and you learn about this early on, where originally the books were, uh, like, journal one, 2012. <laughs> and he's like, well, how could that work? What? I, how would I know things from 2,000, 2000 years, years ago? 2,000 years ago, why would I pick that as a date? <laughs> also, I really, really loved the beginning, where too. It already, hint- like, it shows you already at the beginning, because it's like, something, something, 2011, something, something, 2012, and then it's like, and then it starts giving you the different chapters, and then it gets into the uh, year of the albatross, and then you get that chapter. Um, so prior to all of that, it already happens, and so when the 2,000 whatevers were happening, I was like, he's in a different world and he's stuck and it's actually like 2018 or some shit. Um, but as a side note, just that we get a little bit of this, Celia had a really great input. <laughs> I'm thinking of really working. Oh, wait, hold on a second. I need to back up. Basically there's a discussion of how to shoot a, a artistic European film in the comments. I think it was Valerie saying, Lindbergh, yeah, right both here. of you and I are, no, 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 no it's all the way. No, up it here. goes even farther up. It, it, it was pretty far up. Yeah. That, they were basic- talking. We're both European. Let us make a highbrow European uh, Art Nouveau movie. Yeah, and then Valerie was like, Ali Snow and I are in California. We have different opinions on the book, so we can co-direct it in Hollywood and ruin it with our creative differences. And then it continues on, and then it gets to the part where I really enjoy, which is the whole, I'm thinking of really working with the natural light reflections of the water to symbolize the way thoughts and ideas reflect in our mind, pretentious enough. Our patrons are really funny. You should join um, the get access to the discord support independent journalism come to these live streams they're a lot of fun he realizes that somebody has messed with his journals and also they're uh because he starts reading up on some of these people that the prophet mentioned and then he decides to read up on uh um ketterly and the there's only two a couple of references and the first two aren't really informative but the third one has been ripped out and thrown away uh, somewhere and basically what you learn is that because i'm going to start with lawrence on sales lawrence on sales decide like had the idea that all the magic that people in mythology or not in history talked about and that we think of as mythology all of those ideas all of the ways they interacted with the world were legit but that as society progressed technology progressed science progressed and we no longer needed those things we no longer needed the concept of gods magic all of that that those things then went somewhere else because they weren't needed here they faded out of this world into another world into other places and that there are other worlds and other places you can access to access this power. The metaphor they use a lot is that it's kind of like if underground water went in and carved away the rock and the water may be gone now, but what it carved away is still there in the rock. Which is a beautiful, and that if you go deep enough, you can find the point where there's the underwater well, where the power is contained, which is again, what Ketterly is looking for. Um, and Lawrence on Sales had multiple students and he kind of like, rat packed uh in the sense that like he got a core group of people and they kind of devoted themselves to his ideas his teachings there was that sylvia uh augustino lady Berlusconi. i think um i think he's actually like i don't like i don't know if he's actually based off anyone but he reminds me so much of um this is gonna fucking drive me insane the famous magician also by the way at this point there's now a 16 hour director's cut for our patrons um, uh, adaption, which I feel like, hey, that makes a lot of sense. Alistair Crowley. 
I felt like oh, he was- Oh, yes. He does kind of have those vibes. He Not just kind of. He does have those vibes. Like, literally, the whole description of the of all his exploits later on is literally all the stupid-ass shit crowd. Any of you guys want to learn about Aleister Crowley, I highly suggest Side Note because it is vaguely related. It's because of the whole, like, magical- yeah, da, da, da. Um, uh, Watching uh, um, at- uh, Oh, shit. Podcast at the end of the- Oh, shit. Universe? No. Podcast on the how wait, wait, wait something on the la- back of the left. I, I I'm like blanking right now. Guys, this is what happens when Katie doesn't have alcohol. But anyway, the point is last podcast on the left. There we go. That's what it's called. Um, but anyway, they have a four part series, each one like two hours long on a- how weird Alistair Crowley was. He was a bizarre human being. Anyway. Arn Seals is actually kind of a great character too because he's exactly. like very like uh, arrogant but also like kind of butthurt about the world not taking him seriously. Um, and so. And he's also uh, a bit sexually deviant uh, for the time. That's that's how they describe it. He, he's gay. That's the dishy Italian. The dishy Italian. <laughs> whose name he can't even be bothered to remember even though he got stuck in this world and died but anyway um and lawrence had a lot of uh, eventually lawrence got a hold of a skull of a dead king from a really long time ago with the idea that if he could get uh, if he could gain access to the knowledge of someone who had access to this power he would then be able to interact with it and he does he gets the skull of an ancient king he does a ritual with it and he gains, and it's that name that uh, Ketterly tries to invoke in the early original. It's like Addy something, Addy Domerus. Yeah, Addy Domerus. Um, and uh, from Addy Domerus, he gets information about how to see the paths to different worlds. And basically the idea is you have to put yourself in a, the, in a mindset almost of a child before you were taken in by the ideas of the world that made you understand everything around you. And for him, that was a garden that he used to live in. And he's able to access the paths to different worlds. And he finds this one, this labyrinthian giant house of water and statues. And he was specifically looking for this one too, because he was like, I want one that does this. And then he went there. And what he's looking for is a place where all of the things have passed on to and again i was talking about the house as a collection of concepts ideas literary analogs and it is like you've got uh mythological creatures that we don't talk about and that we don't think exists anymore uh literary ideas concepts all of that but they exist in statue form so this place is kind of an in-between of other things. I also like the idea of birds as being creatures that can pass through this space. I know. Isn't and and cool? come back and forth. Ketterly was one of Lawrence's students. Uh, again, he was part of that rat pack. Eventually, they had a falling out and he separates. But a bunch of the people who were part of Lawrence on sales uh, circle are missing. Also, at a certain point, his cleaning lady kept finding poop and urine <laughs> at a certain point in his house. And they ended up finding a fake wall in his house and there was a guy just going crazy and it was this dude who had been missing for like two years um who had just gone crazy and that was now being stored in his house and the idea you get is this person had been taken into this other world and had lived there for a period of time on his own and gone insane and the idea is the house makes you forget things it makes you forget anything from the before times that and also weirdly enough Everything that you don't need to function um, within this space. And it kind of drives you a bit insane. And this is uh, Ritter, uh, a, a character who the prophet had mentioned. Um, and he had, uh, like I said, been missing. They found him. Lawrence goes to jail for obvious reasons. Um, Lawrence is Apparently starts a bunch of riots there, too. We learn later. He's just such an interesting character. The reason Kernese discovers this is he finds in some of his older journals that he has the ones that aren't named for momentous things that happened during the years he finds out that there's this person uh matthew rose Sorensen, uh who was trying and it's the person who was writing his his journals was writing a book on lawrence on sales he studied people with deviant mindsets and ideas um while all of this is happening and he's making these discoveries and putting all of this information together 16 is popping in he discovers that 16 is actually a woman 16 writes a message that he misunderstands completely. He also doesn't read it because 
the other told him not to read it, so he erases parts of it. And you as the reader are like, oh man, get out. This guy <laughs> This guy is fucking shit up. And and but he's like, wow, he <laughs> 16 is talking about himself here. Um and then there's a point he erases it and he writes a note back saying, I will not read what you write, blah 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 blah. Repent your wickedness. Repent your wicked ways and stop trying to make me go mad, because the other has told him that uh sixteen will make him go mad. And sixteen does not take the slang down. The next message he finds is written in stones. It's like twenty <laughs> meters wide. And it says, Are you Matthew Rose Sorensen? And this makes our and immediately when Piranesi sees that name, it invokes like it rings a bell so he goes to his diaries and he finds out that the person that he potentially used to be was matthew rose Sorensen, and that matthew rose Sorensen was writing a book about lawrence on sales and in the quest to write that book had decided to interview ketterly and so he we get the journal entry that he writes where he goes to uh ketterly's house in battersea to have a conversation with him about lawrence and while they're having that conversation there's a point and most of it is just about lawrence and da 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 but there's a point where ketterly goes does anyone know you're here <laughs> and he's like i mean I, i'm an adult i go where i want to i didn't tell like anyway and immediately i'm like Matthew, get the fuck out, buddy. What are we doing? If Matthew was a woman, that would not have happened. She no, immediately would have been seriously. like, vibes, if, let's get out. If anyone ever said to me, does anyone else know you're here? I, <laughs> I'd be fucking gone. But no, Matthew, a man, is like, no, 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 we'll stay. And then he's, uh, Hatterly goes, do you want to, you want to understand, Lawrence? You really want to understand arm sales? you need to do his ritual. If you do that, it'll, I, I did it and it helped me understand him. But I, if you do it, I think it'll help you understand his mindset, which you need to write this book of yours. And he's like, Matthew's like, yeah, bet. Absolutely. Um, and as it's not going to be real. Yeah. It's not going to be real. Cause he's completely a, a skeptic. Uh, and as Catterly starts setting up the ritual, uh, Matthew notices that, all of the pieces are well used. The groove in the table where the candle is placed is well worn. This is not something he did a couple of years ago. This is something he's consistently done. And in that moment, he realizes that Catterly believes whatever hogwash Lawrence Arnsale has been peddling about getting to other worlds. Matthew's still super skeptical, but there's a point at which he stops. Because, again, it's a journal entry that he is writing that Piranesi, who is fundamentally not Matthew Rose Hornson, is reading. And Matthew stops and says, I shake now because I know what's going to happen. And I, it's hard for me to hold my pen and write this. But at the time, I was completely unafraid. And immediately dread is blooming in your stomach. And you're like, oh, God, I know what happens because I know what happens to you. And I know who you become. And... um. Ketterly does the ritual and the doors open and he shoves Matthew Rose Sorensen into the world of the house and he is stuck there and abandoned and Piranesi stops reading and he just rages. He understands that the other has never been his friend. He has been his enemy. First thing he does is vomit. And he gets very angry that he would have done this to Matthew Rose Sorensen and that he would, and it's the angriest we ever see him. He gets so angry he contemplates killing him. It was such a moment for me, and I don't tend to have strong emotional reactions to books. I was so fucking pissed. It was, I know, I was really angry too. You know what it is, is because it's not just that Ketterly did this. There's such an element of uh, of Piranesi not even realizing what he's lost. Like he has become a lower form of life in a lot of ways. And he can't even comprehend what Ketterly did. And there's such a humiliation to it of, of, of what's happened. And I was just like, oh, I'm so mad at Ketterly. Much more so than I have been at other characters who have done worse things in other books. It just goes to show that, again, it's really about the world that the author sets up and that the actions in it have impact. Absolutely, because it was, and it's such a strong scene because you never see this type of emotion out of Piranesi, and you'll never again. And it's it's funny because he, he two things happen afterwards. Number one, he, he calms down. But number two, he realizes that reaction 
was Matthew Rose Sorensen and that Matthew is inside him, but he is, Piranesi is a fundamentally different person from Matthew. Now, here is a moment where I thought this book could have started transitioning into the idea of Piranesi and Matthew merging into a third person. This is the moment that that should have started. And we should have started, he should have started referring to himself differently because the moment before he finds this out, he is Piranesi. But from this point forward, he is grappling with the fact that he is two people. And so I agree with Will that evolution was brought up too late. It should have been brought up here and it should have been developed so that by the time we get to that point, we're like, yeah, this makes sense. And this is that moment to talk about that. And it's, it's again, it's not bad. The decision wasn't terrible, but it could have been better. Yeah, no, I agree because it's basically treated from this point as though Piranesi, and he'll mention this later, is like, no, Matthew Rose is inside of me. He's asleep. He's fine. Don't worry about it. I'm still me. And so then if you are going to explore how the two of them merge into a different person uh, that's neither quite one or the other, then yeah, this needs to come up earlier than at, as an addendum at the end. And and that's why I think this would be that perfect moment because from this point on, Piranesi knows more than he did before in a fundamental way and understands things in a fundamental way that Piranesi doesn't. And so I think uh, this is the shifting point. And if in... And it doesn't even have to be explicit, like, I am now not Piranesi, but coming to just having things happen where he's like, oh, I think about that differently now, or oh, this. And then for him to name it at the end and be like, I realized that ever since that, that happened, I am now someone else. Piranesi is the before. <laughs> Matthew Rose was, uh, Rose Sorensen was the before before. Um, and now I have to figure out. And I think that could have been a really nice way to clean up that ending a little bit and make that mm -hmm. concept a little bit more fruitful. I wonder if they could, if she could have uh, weaved that into the concept too of the house wanting more people to appreciate it. You know, the concept of like how on earth or reality or whatever you want to call it, like people are just themselves. But then in the other, in the, in the um, house, it's like an idealized true nature of them. And then like, the genesis of that being Piranesi's third, like the evolution into that third. I really like that. I don't feel like that's even really a theme, but I feel like it should have been. No, I think that's true. I think there could have been more done with that idea because it is brought in at the end in a way that I don't fully think connects to the book and what it's been saying as a whole this this whole time. Um, and so, yeah, that's. I think that's one of the ways that the book can be about a lot of things, but it's not fully mature enough in certain ways or hasn't matured some of the themes fully enough to be satisfying so we have this moment something else happened also before this and i have to explain uh piranesi has because of all this shit that's been happening my boy has been real off his schedule so he has not been taking care of his tide tables um and he goes and he looks at it and it's been two weeks since the last time he did his calculations and he's like oh shit <laughs> A huge portion of the house is going to flood. Four different tides are going to converge on the house at the same time. It's going to be potential doomsday. And he tells Ketterly that this is going to happen and that he shouldn't come and, you know, be careful. And he tells him before he discovers what Ketterly did and all the stuff about Matthew Rose Sorensen. I really want to look more into the author. Uh, Lindbergh says, contemplate that Susanna Clark was struggling physical and mental illness when writing this. It's quite a feat. Yeah, apparently she was going through some, like, long illness thing I, I saw a headline about it but i didn't actually click because i don't that's interesting i want to read more about it. i usually don't care about authors but i, I actually her writing is very spiritual so i kind of care more about her or care equally about her as i do as about her writing well and a lot of people have mentioned it's sort of i i don't know when it was written exactly but it's sort of weirdly mirroring of our uh, pandemic experience of being isolated and stuff like that yeah uh, a couple people in the discord brought up how I think it was someone with an L, I forget what her name is, but she's like a psychotherapist and she was talking about how like the book kind of maps onto... Yeah, I'm doing her book right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, it maps onto um, ideas of social isolation and what that does to the brain in terms of your lack of ability to read other people's like emotions to an extent, um, which is, it's interesting because I don't know that I ever felt like Piranesi was lonely in the book. No, he was lonely at the beginning too. Yeah, I guess I just didn't feel a lack in his world in the ways that... So for me, I, I didn't read it as lonely. I, I felt that he was alone, but comfortable. Like, because the yeah. thing is, he didn't know that there was more you could need. 
you know? And so it was, if it was a sense of loneliness, it was something that was deeply buried that he didn't register. He, cause for him, the birds were in, cause he, he doesn't know better to know that to want other people. He discovers that this flood is going to happen. He had warned, warned Ketterly, but afterwards he realizes that Ketterly could, cause they're, they were, in their last conversation, they'd spoken about 16 and he realizes that Ketterly is probably going to use this flood to try trap 16 because uh, immediately the one of the first things our our boy did when he discovered the flood besides telling Catterly was also tell 16 hey there's a flood coming on this day don't be here and then he sees that his message has been completely destroyed and this tells him two things number one Catterly knows that he might know that it, like that uh 16 was here and that he was talking about Matthew uh she was talking about Matthew Rose Sorensen and also that um Piranesi tried to warn uh, her about the flood and um, he destroys it. And so he's like, oh, he's probably going to use the flood to trap 16 and uh, harm her because he had spoken about he got a gun, though he doesn't know how to use it. Um, And so then the day of the flood happens and Piranesi decides he's going to go. He's going to meet Ketterly and he's going to try. 16 is friend, must protect 16, must talk to 16, but must keep Ketterly from hurting 16 and he immediately like he's hiding at first and then he realizes oh 16 is probably also going to be hiding so i should go out and he talks to ketterly and he's like why have you been lying to me also what does the name uh matthew world Sorensen mean to you and um no 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 the way he he tells ketterly is is wonderful i love it which it is. is that he basically he just starts repeating his journal entry of him coming up to the house. And I loved it because it's such a disassociated way of it. It's a PTSD, it. yeah. Yeah, it's so disassociated in that, like, this is not me saying it, but I'm going to let you know by quoting a thing, not that me confronting you directly. I really liked it as a touch of, of character from Piranesi. And so they end up having a bit of a, a tussle. 16 comes out and uh, eventually the, the flood is happening. It is hip hop happening. Uh, Ketterly had got a canoe for himself, an inflatable canoe, and he inflated it. But um, when... Uh, 16 and Piranesi start climbing, he starts trying to shoot them. I just really love the image of, like, him, right? Sasha, excuse you. I just really love the image of Ketterly being, like, come on, Piranesi, what's taking you so goddamn long? And then he's just, like, reciting the fucking PTSD, and he's like, come on, what? What What do you say? Oh, God damn it! And then just like starts going harder. I <laughs> like it's just really like dumb. That. I also love that he had like a life vest on. Like Catterly is such like a middle aged man. It's really He's funny. So funny. But anyway, um, there's a moment where it's flooding so badly that Catterly really should just get into the canoe, um, or not the canoe, the kayak. Um, but he doesn't. He is choosing instead to wade through the water and shoot at 16 and Piranesi. And Piranesi is like, get into the ca- the ca- like, get on the boat. You're not like, what are you doing? And then when he finally decides he's going to give up trying to shoot them because he's bad at it. And he starts <laughs> trying to get the, the kayak. But the kayak at this point, there's the tides are in and it just keeps floating around him. And every time he has to change direction and start wading through like the waist high water to get to it. It moves somewhere else, and there's this one moment where it starts floating towards him, and he just touches it, and then it shoots off in another direction. And then a giant wave comes in and just bodies, bodies him, and they're like, oh shit, he's dead. And the sad thing is, Piranesi is like, no, don't do this. Save yourself. I don't want you to die. You've been, like, the only person I've known for most of my life. Like, and it's just really sad because, like, Piranesi is just a genuinely hecking good boy Labrador, you know? like One of the things we didn't mention is that earlier when um, Ketterly was like, we got to kill 16, he's like, no, we can't kill them. No. You- we can't kill the only other person. He's such a nice character. He has such empathy. Which is so refreshing as of late because we've just been getting, like, there just seems to be a lot of characters lately. And I was reading something else, too, unrelated to the 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 podcast and i was just like why is everybody such an asshole to each other like i'm so sick of the lack of empathy in main characters right now i mean in certain cases they don't even realize that the characters they're writing are terrible a la akawar and because yeah later he recovers Lee's body and actually like kind of holds him and tells him okay look i'll take care of you now you won't be one of the dead um he um 
He always mentions that his fishing nets are made out of a very fine composite. Because um, what he does is he wraps them in a fishing net so that the birds and the fish can feed on him and strip his bones clean. And then he'll put the bones in with everybody else. And he's like, it, it was a very like, it's a moment where you're like, yeah, no, he was his only friend, even if he did this. And Piranesi can't quite understand that anger in the way that Dylan Mulvaney, that's not his name, could. Matthew Rose Sorensen. Matthew Rose Sorensen. The other is dead. Uh, he is currently up on a, like, in the lap of a statue <laughs> with uh, 16, who introduces herself, and the other called uh, 16, Raphael. Um, and uh, basically, Raphael is a cop who was looking for Matthew Rose Sorensen. They had zero leads uh, as to the disappearance until one of the people Matthew had originally called, because the only other person who had written a book about uh, Lawrence on sales was this one lady. And Matthew called her to get some information and also see, Hey, are you okay if I write a book about him as well? And she was like, absolutely. You know, mine was just kind of a biography. It wasn't an analysis. You should absolutely do this. Can we just say that the listings of all the things that Matthew has published is cool as shit. Like he wrote some <laughs> cool act. Like I actually, in that moment when I was re when he was reading all the publications that his old self had done, I was like, "This is such a loss." It's because he was like an artist and an author, and like and he was academic. making. Yeah, he was making. He he was a but he was like the out of all three of the main academics in this piece, he was the only real academic. Like. In the end. That is actually kind of interesting. It's on purpose, I assumed. It's because he, uh, there's that one scene where he's with um, on sales and he's like, yeah, the statues represent blah, 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 right? And then he's just like, huh, I never thought about it like that. That's quite creative. And so I'm like, oh, so he's the evolved version of these two people because he has that open, that, that it's all his publications have to do with pushing the envelope and what is not accepted. But not just that. The other two are trying to discover and take something. And, and he just wants to explore it. And understand. Matthew Rose Sorensen is writing and researching for the sake of analysis. And the other two are for the sake of uh, acquiring. It's one of the reasons that I think the book doesn't quite grapple with the loss of be because, again, I, I feel like some people took from the book that, like, you know, it's hopeful or Piranesi is able to understand things it, like he's ascended a little bit to like a higher being. But I, I don't think so. Like, especially at the end. Um, well, actually, I'll talk about that when we get there. But I just felt like the book doesn't quite grapple with the loss of this man. Fine Man Production says, yeah, Soren was a legitimately accomplished academic and Ketterly took it from him. I hated that. I fucking hated that and i you're like, right when, it, the book doesn't deal with it enough when i read that when he was just literally but i don't i don't think that needs to happen for that particular thing the other things we've discussed and agreed upon you know i understand we understand each other but like that particular thing i think reading his publications was impactful enough because the theme of the novel with the other characters it all comes together in a cauldron of bubbling potion where when i read that i know what she's telling me She's telling me, look at all this great stuff he did. It's gone. That man is dead. You'll never have him. I think what I mean is I wish Piranesi would have had a moment where he would have acknowledged what I don't need it. The world lost with Matthew. That's too much. Yeah, he's almost too simple to understand it. And again, that I, I would have liked the book to kind of underline that in that like, yeah, no, it's it's not because again, Piranesi is just very chill about having lost this person and he never really gets him back. He understands a little bit towards the end. But I like that concept of like the echo of a concept echoing but not being explored because because it's like it's it's like a reference being made in a movie that from another movie and you're not real it's not supposed to be explored but it's the reference the joy of it like that kind of thing but it's not joy you know like it's the it's the sadness and the emptiness yeah. of the echo being heard but not being seen you are absolutely valid in the that i just for me personally i lean a little bit more to with william where i just would have liked a a, a bit more of that because i do find it very tragic i like the idea of piranesi mourning for the world for that you know, like that, that loss. And, and because he, he feels so deeply and empathetically about what the surrounding, like for him, the house is his world and he feels for it. And I like the idea of him, uh, feeling on behalf of the loss of Matthew, not for himself, but just in general. And so the next thing that happens is that pretty much Raphael is like, Hey, do you want to come back to our world? Matthew Rose Sorensen's like, 
mother and father and sisters, they miss him. And he's like, oh, just tell them that like he's here with me and I'm taking care of him. And I'm very, I'm very good at taking care of myself. I catch many fish. Um, just tell them that. And he's like, and weirdly, she didn't think that was going to comfort them. Um, and he's like, and she's like, well, why don't you come with me? And he's like, I have uh, far too much to do. I have to move all the people back to their alcoves. I have to make sure they're taken care of. I can't even really think about it right now. Um, and so Raphael comes, he does all those things. Raphael comes and visits a couple times and is like, wow, this is a cool library. And he shows her around and he realizes that like, he always kind of thought the other was in the library, even though he didn't see them. And now that he knows he isn't, the whole place feels more lonely. And so he decides he's going to go back to the real world, which I did think was a little fast. Like it, it, he really loves this place and it's all he knows. Um, and so they step into the real world and then we catch up to him like, I don't know, a year or two later. I don't know how long it's been um, a bit. And like he still is, he says he's not quite Matthew and he's not quite Piranesi anymore. Um, and he kind of understands how the world works, even though he's kind of like weirded out by certain things like money. Like, just give me give me the thing you need. And when you need something, I'll give you the thing I have. Like, I don't understand why we have to do this whole dance about it. Um, but he kind of understands the world and he kind of um, is able to live in it. But I, I, I don't know. This felt a little undefined to me as to how in this world he is uh, and like how well he does navigate it and what he feels like in it. Um, because the only thing, real interaction we get is him with like a detective guy or a journalist. I don't remember. He had a very good accent. Um, and he was like, and, and there still seemed to be a lot of the Piranesi childishness about him there and simplicity. I also liked how in that conversation with that detective, that other detective, he wasn't belittled. Like the way he phrased things or the way he interacted, like the, the it wasn't off. Like, like I, I was really worried about just having scenes of Piranesi continuing to be like how he was belittled with the other or uh, disregarded. And I liked that despite the weirder way he phrased things, that other cop just like genuinely engaged with him. And I really liked that. Um, and I, it's interesting because this for me, the, the very end has the most beautiful thing, which we've talked about before, which is that. Piranesi slash Matthew slash whoever this other person is um, has now like interacted with the world in a way where he uses the other world, the home, the house to understand people here that the house has is not has not lost its value. It has not lost its meaning that he can just engage with. Um, it, when he sees someone, he can see a statue that tells him how to understand that person. It is the ruler by which he understands and measures the world and quantifies it. And he describes uh, different people and different things and the statues that correlate and how he understands who they are or what they are because of it. And it is so beautiful. It is just an absolutely gorgeous end to the book. And it's it also just puts the house into perspective of what its value is. Also, I really like that he took Ritter back. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I think it's so funny that he's like, no, you never learn to feed yourself here. You can't stay like there, that, 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 um, that practicalness to Piranesi is always very funny to me. And so it was nice to see it at the last moment. And like so he sees like a man in the real world who like his face is that of a king in the other world. And so he's like, you know, you're not just this, you are also that. And one of the key lines that Raphael had said um, back when they were just exploring the library was that, um, you know, she goes, you know, th these are just um, reflections of the real world. In the real world, you really can go to the mountain. And he says, I don't like how you said only there. That disparages this. This is the perfected version of that. This is like the platonic, he doesn't say platonic ideal, but this is the pl platonic ideal of that. That will fade and degrade over time, but these statues won't. Um, and so that's also something the book is trying to say in the way that he connects to the real world now. But like, I, we, we don't really get enough of him connecting to the real, like if you're gonna have him go back to the real world, you need to actually show how this works versus kind of just mentioning it in the last few pages. This also connects back to the Renaissance idea of a mind palace, where if you need to remember things, you put them in your brain as symbolic. So, um, uh, uh, so like, I think it was like a Christmas war you would think of as a sword and a 
whatever the, the holly things are called, uh, or like a wreath in a place in the room, and then if you need to remember something, you back, uh, go back over there, which is essentially what the house was for him, and he mentions that he can still go through the house in his mind. Um, and so that's cool, but I don't necessarily know that it formulates into like a theme. It's just kind of like an interesting connection. Again, for me, it is how humanity uses literature and mythology and past ideas to understand day-to-day interactions and how we go forward that for me is the theme the house is a collection of ideas and concept and literary analogs and that is how we understand the world and give meaning to it boom that's cool but if 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 that was the theme and i i mean i do think that makes sense then we need more examples of how that functions in the real world how he maps that onto the real world and his relationships and his understanding of it i think that would have that's why the end feels kind of slight and a couple of people are, are saying how emotional it was for them valerie says i teared up at the end and i was reading in a room full of people watching football, watching football. oh no i didn't tear up but i had that that bittersweet loss you feel at the end of like a really good book to it it was just it felt like very like impactful and i think it really is a beautiful ending for me that very end part and the idea of him using the house to understand people is one of my favorite parts about everything and puts the house into perspective for me. As much as I've mentioned things that I would have liked a little bit differently. I mean, Angry Otter made a great point earlier. Uh, I think I would have been annoyed if the book meandered down every path instead of peeking into it and moving on. And I I really think that that is the purpose of the book. And a, a lot of people have been agreeing with Katie about like not wanting an explicit Thing about mourning the loss of Matthew Rose Sorensen. And I really just think depending on who you are as a reader, there are parts you're just going to be more curious about and you're going to have wanted more about. And I don't think that's wrong, but I also think there are going to be readers who aren't interested in that particular thing, but maybe something else that was said are going to be interested in that thing and want more from it that in that place. And I think part of that is just the openness in how she wrote this that just allows for all the interpretations and all the different reader interactions. Yeah, so for example, Celia said, I disagree, I don't want it to be more grounded at the end or connected more to the real world. It would have taken away from the mystic vibes. So that's one thing is that like this book does have such beautiful vibes and I get that that would have taken away from it and it may be more valuable to have those vibes than to have, uh, but that's where I think it should have ended before he got back to the real world. Like I, I don't, I think if it's just vibes, then the vibes suffer because because he does go to the real world. But yeah, again, I think it's a really beautiful book. It's really well written. I'm, I really want to read her other book now, Doctor Strange and Mr. Norrell, I think it's called. Norrell. Yeah, everybody has always been saying to read it, but I, I don't like doing what people tell me. I know. But we'll put it on the list now, I think. I did really enjoy it. I do think it actually has a, a lot to say. I don't think it quite says it as coherently as it could, but that's also just kind of a decision. Um, on the author's part. Have a good rest of your day, or I guess whenever you're watching this, ha- have a have a good day, night, morning, whatever. Bye.